from the Fisher Phillips Law Firm, please welcome Katherine Sandberg. Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing? Good. I trust you uh, didn't get you out of control last night. We're all here and alert, so that's good. We're off to a good start. Um, so thank you so much, Larry, for the great introduction. As he mentioned, my name is Catherine. I work out of the Sacramento office of Fisher Phillips, but I have clients throughout the state, um, and I love representing auto dealers. I think, you know, based on the, the conversations I was having with people last night, you know, you're a great group, um, and you absolutely have, you know, something worth defending. Um, a lot of you are in a family business, and, and um, you know, you're, you're few and far between uh, these days. So. Thank you so much for having me. With that being said, we're going to get into the top five ways that employers get sued in California. And there, there are way more than five. Um, and I do have a very ambitious schedule for us. So we'll try to skip through it um, as, as quickly as I can while giving you as much information as I can. Uh, but keep in mind, we're, we're just getting our feet wet. Um, so the, the, the way a lawsuit starts, of course, is uh, with the employee. And so to the extent that you are hiring questionable individuals, um, you know, you're, you're going to get yourself into some trouble, perhaps. In addition to the people you're hiring, the, the hiring process itself is, is a way that you can run into a lawsuit. In fact, just just yesterday, we had a bill pass. It's now a law. You can't ask about salary history anymore. So it's constantly changing. Um, in, uh, also in this round of legislation, we have a bill um, that's pending. I suspect the governor's going to sign it that will prohibit you from asking on your job applications about criminal convictions. So it's, it's known as ban the box. You will have to take, literally take the checkbox off of your job applications uh, but you also won't be able to ask about it during the hiring process. Some, some classic questions, though, that could run afoul of the laws uh, in terms of discrimination. Asking someone how old they are. Um, you know, a better way to, to rephrase that, are you 18 or older? Can, can, you, you, know, can you work here? Um, or where is your accent from? A, a better way to ask that would be, uh, you know, make it related to the job. Are, are you bilingual? Do you speak Spanish? Um, asking someone if they're legal or if they're a, an illegal alien. Instead you ask, well, can you provide proof of your authorization to work in the United States? Um, how is your health? You, you'd ask instead, can you, know, can you perform the essential functions of the job? So there are a, a lot of very tricky ways that you might get into trouble and run into a discrimination claim, perhaps. With respect to your want ads, in addition to the questions that you're asking, you're, you're, if you're advertising for a position, the want ads need to be um, non-discriminatory as well. So you can't make any sort of reference toward age. You do need to specifically state that you're an equal opportunity employer, so pay attention to your ads. In addition to that, if, if this ban the box legislation passes, you will have to specifically put in your want ads that uh, that you that you are complying with that legislation. There's specific language there. Um, for those of you who are in the city of Los Angeles, this is already a requirement that you should be used to, based on their ban the box law. Yes. So by ban the box, can you still run a background check? Only after a conditional offer of employment is made. Um, and then once you make that conditional offer, and then you go through the background check process, and let's say their, their background check comes up, you know, they're a convicted felon. If you were to withdraw your offer based on that, you have to go through um, this whole series of, of hoops, which you know, I, won't, I won't get into, but uh, if you go onto our website, um, and search ban the box, you'll be able to find articles on it. Uh, for those of you um, who, who aren't familiar with Fisher and Phillips, um, our website has a lot of great resources. Um, if you give me your card or get my card and I can get you guys signed up for our legal alerts. Yes? Um, 
in our industry, uh, salesmen have a lot of, uh, they're, they're looking at credit applications, they're looking at social security numbers, and hiring a, a felon in a position where they're, they're getting private information from a consumer is dangerous. Absolutely. Um, is, that, is that enough reason to, uh, when you do the background check, to not, not hire that individual? It depends on what their conviction is for. So if, if we're talking about a conviction for, um, you know, marijuana, uh, and they used it a few years ago or something, you know, it, it's, going to, it's going to depend greatly. Um, and that's why it's going to put such a burden on employers if, and like I said, likely when the governor signs this bill. Um, so it'll be at the latest by Sunday, I believe, is, is when he needs to sign. So keep an eye out for that, absolutely. Yes. Uh, a question. Yes. Uh, actually, your response uh, triggered one. Uh, is it okay to ask about the marijuana use? No, that's legal. So, no, you still, you can't ask about criminal convictions. Um, and so to the extent that they have that, or, or any sort of criminal background during the application process, um, and you can't do anything to you know, solicit that information. And that can go beyond just asking them directly. Um, and like I said, so this is all still pending. It's not signed yet. Um, unless you're in LA, then something similar already applies to you. A great way to screen out pro problem employees is by having a comprehensive job application. Um, make sure the applicant signs the job application. And then once you get it back, uh, examine it carefully. And these are some, some key components of uh, a good job application um, to the extent that you're drug testing, pre-employment uh, pre drug testing, you get a consent form for that. Um, make note that the job is at will. Include a arbitration agreement with an opt-out provision. Um, and then also include uh, language that says that you can terminate them for dishonesty, including dishonesty on the job application itself. Then once you actually get the application and you're looking at it, um, a, a lot of red flags that I tend to see when I get files um, from former employees that then turn around and sue their employers, they'll say, uh, they'll give very vague descriptions on why they left their previous employment, for example. Um, they'll reference you know, unfair treatment or uh, not a good fit. Uh, and so, so that, that gives you some sense that that's, that person is prone to conflict. In addition to that, if you have a section that has them fill out their previous employment and when they worked, um, and then they just write C resume and they decide to you know, disregard the format of your job application, a lot of these individuals bring claims because they feel entitled. Um, and uh, someone who feels entitled is going to you know, skip over your job application because it's not worth their time. They'll, they'll just say, oh, you know, look at my resume. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna follow the format that you've requested. Do you, do you have a, um, an application that you can share with us? A job app that we can have as a file that uh, we can punch it up and customize it to our, ourselves? So that's something that I do um, as part of my general advice and counsel to my clients. I'll put together their job applications. Um, I don't have those listed on the website, but if you email me um, and you're, you're interested in setting up, you know, for example, having an opt-out agreement um, or having me review your job application, you can absolutely do that. And it's generally a pretty quick, um, uh, a quick thing to go through. Um, and you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. So um, if you have concerns about your application, especially after if, if this ban the box legislation turns into law, I highly suggest it. Another hot topic that I've been encountering with a lot of my clients is, um, and we <coughs> mentioned it already, is, is legalized recreational marijuana. Um, so clients are calling me asking, okay, well, do, you know, I have to allow my, my uh, employees to use marijuana during non-work time? What, what are the parameters there? Um, can I continue to enforce my drug-free workplace policy? Yes, uh, the, the quick answer to that is yes. So using marijuana at work or being under the influence of marijuana at work 
um, may absolutely still be prohibited. The law does not require you to accommodate someone's medical use as a reasonable accommodation. Um, the prohibitions against off-duty use are a little less clear, um, but by and large, you would approach it similarly to the way that you would, say, approach alcohol, where if someone's coming to work drunk, obviously that's not acceptable. Alcohol is legal, but it doesn't mean that you can come to work impaired. Um, the status of the law on a yes. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, uh, just please. Just going back to that last section, um, how does that apply to, how does that apply to drug testing? If someone's using marijuana recreationally, um, you know, what would be the purpose of even drug testing at that point? Well, so we have to distinguish between pre-employment drug testing and drug testing your current employees. Um, simply drug testing your current employees on a randomized basis, just blanket drug testing is not permissible. Uh, it's going to expose you to a invasion of privacy claim. You're only allowed to drug test current employees if you have reasonable suspicion that they're impaired. Um, but as far as pre-employment drug testing, you know, that, that is an issue because THC stays in the system um, differently than, say, alcohol would. You know, you could have someone who used a couple of weeks before their test, um, and then their test is going to come back positive. And so that, that's an issue that, uh, for example, in Colorado, a lot of, a lot of our clients have um, actually lowered their standards in terms of drug testing because they can't get <coughs> enough qualified applicants because everyone is popping up as, as having used marijuana. Um, so that the, the effect on drug testing is, is hazy um, at best. Um, but I, I think the important thing to remember is that um, it's not something that you have to permit. You can continue to uh, keep heightened standards, um, and that's true because the federal law says that marijuana is still a Schedule One narcotic. Other Schedule One narcotics include heroin, for example. Uh, marijuana is still is still on that list, and so that's for that reason, uh, employers don't need to accommodate it. Yes. So, and uh, we have the salesman drive the uh, go on demos with customers. So. Our, well, we've recently changed our hiring processes. We do, we do uh, have a background check and drug testing when we're hiring someone. Um, and we, we look at the level of almost all of them have, unfortunately, almost everybody has a marijuana in their system. And so you have a threshold. We have a threshold. If, it's, if it exceeds a certain amount, then, we're, then we won't hire them. Um, and I'm assuming that's, that's okay to do that. And the reason why we don't is that um, lack of productivity as an as a employee, but also um, if they're going on test drives with customers and they have a high system of marijuana in their system, which tells us that they, not it's, it's more than recreational, they really love digging deep into it. Absolutely. Is there is there any liability for a dealership that would hire somebody that has that has, that you do drug testing? They have a high level of marijuana in their system. You still hire them anyways. They go out on a test drive. They get in an accident because they were high. Could, could that potentially create a loss? dealership where the consumer is saying, listen, I was, the dealership should have known that this, this employee that they hired is, is uh, abusive on, on smoking your own. Right, you could, you could expose yourself to a negligent hiring claim in that case. So, you know, it's, it's important, I think, to have a balance of, like you said, a threshold where, you know, someone who has just the trace amount in their system, if you get to that point where you aren't able to um, get an applicant pool where nobody's used marijuana, um, you know, then you, you can adjust that threshold accordingly. So Prop 64 then in California um, legalized recreational marijuana, as we all know. Um, you can have a certain number of plants, you can possess a certain amount of marijuana. There are still certain things that you can't do though. Um, so you're not allowed, for example, to consume marijuana in a public place. Um, you can't smoke or vaporize marijuana in a non-smoking uh, area or near schools. You know, so it's, it's, not, it's not a free-for-all. Um, 
you, you are not allowed to manufacture concentrated cannabis, for example. Minors under 21 can't possess marijuana. So um, there, there are restrictions, um, and it, like I said, it's, it's not, you know, the, it's not a uh, free reign over, over cannabis use. Um, additionally, you can't possess more than an ounce. If you do, it's still a misdemeanor. So what does this mean then for employers? Um, you know, what, what sort of impact does this have? Well, like I said, uh, the, the statute itself actually doesn't impact your ability to maintain your drug-free workplace policy. Um, it doesn't require you to, um, re to permit accommodations for marijuana, um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really impede your rights as an employer um, in any regard. In large part, that's due to the fact that it's still a Schedule One drug, but also the statute explicitly says So, simple answer, summed up, it's on a federal level, it's still illegal. You can still enforce your drug policies. The best response that I can tell you to give to employees who say, oh, you know, well, um, marijuana's legal now, I can use it, you can still say, well, you know, as an employer, we're required to abide by California and federal law, and under federal law, marijuana is still an illegal substance, Therefore, we, we still enforce our drug-free workplace policy. Coming to work impaired is not permissible. Um, and then you can just leave it at that. Big issues with um, payment of your employees, the way you're paying your employees. Um, so that's the number two, the number two way to encounter um, a law student, when I was talking with Larry about this presentation, he mentioned that some of you have had encounters with the labor commissioner, for example, where employees are bringing claims, um, and that's something that, that I deal with often on behalf of my clients. And so it's, it's a pretty common thing for um, employers, and especially in, in the dealership arena where you're paying people on commission, um, they'll bring claims against you later on based on based on how you're paying them. And the problem is that defending wage and hour lawsuits that have any sort of colorable arguments in favor of the employee is pretty difficult. You're ultimately going to end up paying something. Um, plaintiff's attorneys love these kind of claims because they're able to recover a lot of money. Um, there's potential for liquidated damages, which means double back pay. Um, and so it gets, it gets very expensive. Automatic attorney's fees, which is why attorneys are incentivized to bring these claims in the first place. Um, so, th so they're really a nightmare. The, the moral of the story is you need to prevent these little issues before they <coughs> turn into a claim. Um, like I said, uh, an ounce of, of prevention is a pound of fear. So, um, at the same time, though, you know, you're, you're busy with your business, and um, it's pretty easy to overlook these things. Um, so, you know, you need to actually start taking preventative measures, um, and I'll, I'll talk about what you can do in that regard. Some of you might think, well, you know, we're, we're too small. Um, well, that's not the case. Anyone is, can be subject to a potential wage and hour claim. Um, even a claim with the labor commissioner can be a big headache. Um, everybody I know pays this way. You know, th these are all uh, famous last words that I've heard um, from clients. So th the moral of the story is, you know, it's it's not safe to just do what everyone else is doing. You need to make sure you're complying with the law. Yes. What's our exposure for an employee who doesn't take a lunch that day? So, so they know it's a policy that they're supposed to clock out for lunch, but if they forget to or they want to go home early that day and they don't take their lunch and they come to the end of the day, I want to go home early today because I didn't take a lunch. Now it's too late to tell them to go back in and take their lunch. They've already stamped on their time card. They write in, you know, 
for too much. Right. Both. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'll get into the the meal breaks um, momentarily, but the short answer is that you are required to. <laughs> Uh, make the meal periods available, but you're not required to police them or, you know, force your employees to take their lunch. Um, but a, a bit more on that uh, further, further on. Pretty popular are off the, yes. So question, given that you're uh, playing commission only, can you do just a 1099 just to say who they pay or, or we have to put it on a, on a you know, regular wage so we can deduct it and see how she can improve more of an income instead of just a 1099 where they, you know, like everything comes to the work. You should not be 1099ing your employees. They should all be receiving W-2s, um, and to the extent that you're doing that and they aren't independent contractors, which in California, um, let's, let's be honest, there really isn't such a thing as an independent contractor. Um, you're going to expose yourself to an EDD audit, potentially. Uh, Likewise, you know, if they bring their claim to the labor commissioner or any sort of decent plaintiff's attorney, you're going to expose yourself to claims that way as well. Um, so I would not be 1099. So only just uh, like our, uh, say, uh, our vendors. Those are you can 1099 your vendors, yes. That's, that's Employees, no, no. So, so a vendor cannot come and, you know, if you give 1099, they cannot do a lot of well, anyone can file a lawsuit against you. That's, but. What, that's what I'm asking. Like, you know, like, them people that are vendors, they sure. can them, like, but if you have the food, like, you pay them all the time on 1099, then they provide your, you know, like, ability, license, and everything. Is that, like, something that you guys do also, or something? Sure. That, those are claims that we see. That's Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so, looks like I'm, I'm running a little low on time, so I'll hold questions until the end. Um, but... If you have any, my, my email and my direct line are on the presentation. Um, so off the clock claims are pretty popular. Um, the employee will say, oh, well, you know, I did work before I clocked in or my employer had me clock out. Um, so those, those are things to, to watch out for. Uh, maintain a policy that strictly prohibits off the clock work and communicate to your employees that work begins when you first start your first activity of the day. That's when you need to be clocked in. Um, keep an eye out on any sort of pre-shift or post-shift activities that your employees are engaging in um, and carefully review time records. That's extremely important. Um, likewise, train your managers on the, on the policy as well. What about salaried employees? You know, you think, okay, well, I've, I've got someone on a salary, so I don't need to worry about rest breaks um, or overtime. Long and short, paying someone a salary does not make them exempt. Um, you have to meet a duties test as well. Um, so for example, there's, a, there's an exemption for commission salespeople, um, where if they are inside sales and they receive you know, more than half of their salary in commission and you pay them um, one and a half times the minimum wage each pay period, then they're going to be exempt from overtime. Um, and that's a per pay period analysis. So you can be exempt one pay period and not exempt in another. Things get a little bit tricky, uh, but you, you have to meet a duties test in order to be truly exempt from overtime. You can also take away someone's overtime exemption based on changing their duties or, for example, having them perform clerical work when, you know, they're an executive or um, they fall into some other category. Um, so those are, those, th those are things to keep in mind. What about overtime? Uh, another common misconception is that um, oh, you know, California overtime is straightforward. I'll ask clients, hey, do you pay your employees overtime? And they say yes, and then it turns out once I dive into their, into their records, that is not the case. They weren't paying overtime properly because there are additional requirements. You might have daily overtime, double time applies in certain instances, and seventh day premiums. Um, so one and a half times the regular rate 
for hours over eight. Um, that's, that's the general guideline. And then double time, for example, when you have someone working over 12 hours in a day um, or in excess of eight hours on the seventh consecutive day of work. Like I mentioned, you have to be paying overtime unless they fall within an exemption and for the exemption they need to meet both a duties test and get the, the uh, meet the salary threshold as well. Um, so it's two parts. If they don't meet one of those parts, then they are not exempt and you should have been paying over time. So documentation and keeping track of your employees' time is essential. Um, so if you don't know how many hours your employees are working, you're not going to be able to keep track of, you know, have they worked 40 hours this week. Um, if, you, if you are, you know, keeping track of their hours, you need to keep track of, well, what did they work in a day, and then what did they work in a week. Um, like I mentioned, you know, if, if you're working over eight hours in a day, you should get overtime. If you're working more than 40 hours in a week, you should be paying overtime. Now, as I mentioned before, with uh, off-the-clock claims, um, you need to focus on the hours that someone actually works. Um, the timekeeping obligation is going to fall on you. So, to the extent that you might argue, oh, you know, well, they didn't tell me they worked. Well, it was it was your responsibility to keep track of it. Um, so, any time that they work, they need to be paid appropriately for that work. There are some common areas I think that people run into in terms of timekeeping. Um, and like I, like I said with off the clock class actions, I think that's pretty typical. But some other examples, if you have people training or going to meetings, uh, traveling, uh, dealerships, I'm, I'm sure you're probably not having people work from home. Meal and rest periods are huge. <coughs> um, and then off the clock work. And with respect to your time records, you need to be keeping track of the daily amount of time, um, total, total hours worked each work week, and then um, any sort of, any overtime that, that they're earning. Uh, those, are all, those are all things that you need to be vigilant about. There isn't any sort of system that you should use, um, you know, as long as you're keeping track of it. However, the best practice is to use an automated system, such as you know a time clock or computer program where people can um, clock in and clock out that way to capture their time and attendance. And if you are doing that in an automated way, you need to make sure that it's calculating everything appropriately. So it's not a defense to say, oh, well, my, my system did it this way. And, you know, now, now you didn't pay someone overtime properly. Uh, that's not going to work. Another important practice is to have, at the end of pay, the pay period, have the employee uh, review their time records and then sign off on them. Because it's going to make it much more difficult for them later on to say, you know, oh, well, um, I, I worked more or uh, what have you, you, you have the record that says, no, you looked at this, you acknowledged that these time records were accurate, um, and you certified that. So, another, uh, another good thing to include in your acknowledgements on your time records is that the, the person or the individual who is certifying that they worked wasn't you know, harassed or discriminated or retaliated against based on any claims. Um, that they weren't injured during the work period. Workers' comp is another major headache, as I'm, as I'm sure some of you might have experienced. Additionally, it's, it's important for you um, as the employer then to be reviewing the time records and double check and make sure there aren't any errors. And if you do notice any issues, then address them right away.
Another big problem that I see clients uh, have is they automatically deduct time for meal breaks. Um, so they'll automatically deduct 30 minutes. It's not permissible to do that. And that's why it's a good idea to have an automated system that has someone punch in and out, especially systems that will not let people punch in until they've taken a full 30 minute break. So, again, as I mentioned, the biggest issue with non-compliance um, in wage and hour is the potential damages that someone can receive. Um, unpaid overtime, unpaid minimum wage, and then you get liquidated damages on top of that, um, and attorney's fees, so it can add up really quickly. And so it's, it's really important that you um, stay on top of it. So then let's, let's get to your question on meal periods. So the meal period needs to be taken within the first five hours. It has to be at least 30 minutes long, and it needs to be uninterrupted, meaning if someone's on their lunch, you can't go and say, hey, you know, um, can you go do this or that uh, in the middle of their lunch? If you do that, you have to allow them to restart their break. Um, in other words, they, they need to be off duty. It's, it's an off-duty meal period. Um, there's a very minor exemption for uh, a working meal period. It's only going to be allowed if the nature of the job um, requires it and if there are certain waivers and procedures that you followed in place with respect to those waivers. Um, so sum up, sum up with respect to meal periods is I would implement a meal period policy if you have it in your handbook. Um, if you don't, make sure you put a policy in your handbook that comports with, with the law. Um, so going back to the question of, you know, you've got an employee who knows that, that the 30 minutes is available to them, um, you don't need to ensure that they're not performing work or that they're taking their meal period. Um, you don't need to police them as long as you are, as the employer, relieving them of all duty, um, then you're not going to be liable for a meal period premium if the employee of their own volition chooses not to work. Um, however, that being said, if you know or if you reasonably should have known that the employee is working during their meal period, uh, you're, then you're going to be liable. So. Um, if you're aware that, that someone's working, it's in your best interest to um, clamp down on that and insist that no, you know, you're off duty during your 30, during this 30 minute meal period. Um, you should also be really careful about allowing employees to self-schedule their meal periods because there are timing requirements. So at the, at the uh, fifth hour is, is when they should be taking their meal period. Um, so if you have any sort of understanding that your employees are significantly deviating from what, what's required in the labor code, um, you, need, you have an obligation as the employer to ensure that they're not working. Um, otherwise, you can ultimately be found to have ratified um, an illegal schedule. Quick so question. Is it prudent to make a form and have the employee acknowledge that that's a requirement so that if they choose not to take a lunch, you can show a form that I told you in written form to take your lunch break every day and you didn't abide by the, the rule. Right, that's part of it. And so it's normally something I would include in a handbook and have the employee acknowledge, um, sometimes even a, a separate meal and rest policy, depending on the employer, and uh, having the employee acknowledge that they received the handbook, that they've reviewed it, um, and then they sign off on it. So that when there's a claim later on, if there's a claim later on, I, I often point to the rest period policy in the handbook. Assuming it's compliant with the law, I, I see a lot of clients who don't have compliant policies listed in their handbook, so that's not helpful um, if you're defending a claim and, and ultimately the other side's going to point to that and say, well, look at your policy, it wasn't, it wasn't correct. Um, so yes, the answer to, to that question is yes. So the, the on-duty meal period, it's a very narrow exception. Um, you 
you're going to have to have them sign a volunteer, it has to be a voluntary written waiver with a specific clause that allows them to revoke. Um, they're going to have to be compensated for the meal period, and that includes overtime, but, and they also have to actually be able to um, eat a meal during that period. So it, it's, going to, um, it's going to be pretty narrow. Um, one example is you know, someone in like a, a kiosk where there's just one employee, um, or a, a gas station attendant in the middle of the night when there's only one person there. Otherwise, chances are um, the on-duty meal period isn't going to apply to you. Rest periods, you need to make sure that everyone is taking a 10 minute rest period for every four hours worked. Um, they get one if they work at least three and a half hours. Um, so you need to make determine how many rest periods should be provided based on how many hours the person is working in their shift. Um, and then schedule one or two as required by law. Um, and then provide it uh, as far as practical in the middle of the work period. And keep in mind the 10 minutes then needs to be paid. Um, there isn't a waiver allowed for rest periods, um, and employees can't be pressured to waive them at all. So the best, the best practice for anyone who isn't sure if they're complying with wage and hour law in California, which chances are you know, you're making some mistakes somewhere, it's very complicated, um, conduct an audit. Um, right now and check your policies, check your payroll records. Depending on the number of employees, you can take a representative sample if you have hundreds of employees um, so that it's not too overburdensome for you. Um, and my suggestion is to conduct that in conjunction with your labor and employment council so that you have attorney-client privilege covering that audit. Um, otherwise, someone will be able to get that information in discovery later on if they bring a claim. So um, it's always best to, to have your attorney work with you on it. How far back do we need to hold records? For, uh, for wage and hour purposes, I would suggest four years. Um, and it depends, I mean, if they're a current employee versus someone who used to work for you, um, it, it's going to vary, but um, suggestion is four years. So this is a this is a good sum up of what should be included in your employee handbook. Um, and then, in addition to having a solid handbook in place, train your managers, um, and that's training that that I conduct as well. And it's it's uh, it's very enlightening, I think, for. Um, for, a lot, for all the managers who participate, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're, your, they're the front lines and they're the ones who are keeping track of, of your employees' hours. So it's a good idea. Number three way um, to get sued, blow off people's complaints. Um, so if someone is making a complaint of harassment or discrimination, it's important to investigate it right away. Um, because there is a defense available if someone brings a claim against you later on that you, you know, had these policies in place to investigate and that you, you know, made them available and the employee didn't, didn't take advantage of them. Um, documentation is always important. Uh, if I get, you know, a complaint, I like to see a full file of, of written documentation, not, not verbal. Um, in addition, if you can have the person who is actually making the complaint write it down for you, that locks them in in terms of what the, what claims they're making, so they can't tack on to it later on when they find when they find an attorney and decide you know this would this would be a convenient claim for me to make, um, or this would allow me to sort of embellish things to to make it um, to make give myself more of a recovery. Another possible option for you to consider is that you put the alleged harasser on a leave of absence while you investigate the complaint. Um, 
generally speaking, I don't recommend putting the, the person who's making the claim on a leave of absence that can expose you to a retaliation claim. Um, so best practice is, is the harasser goes on leave. Then you, you would also want to figure out, you know, who knows about this and, and get fully document um, what they say happened. Uh, again, written statements from them are great. And then from there, you know, you need to take action. So figure out what went wrong, what you can do in the future. Um, because if you allow the behavior to continue, uh, especially with that particular claimant, then they're going to be able to say, hey, well, you know, you knew about this and um, there are additional claims that they can make based on that. Also notify the victim of what you're doing. Um, a lot of times people just feel like, you know, the, the employer didn't hear them out or treat them fairly in this situation. Um, so open lines of communication are key. In your handbook, you should have a harassment policy that provides them with the methods that they should go through to make a complaint um, so that they're fully aware. A lot of the times I have a separate harassment um, policy in the handbook that they can sign off on. Additionally, for those of you with 50 or more employees, you are required by law to conduct sexual harassment training every two years, and it has to be conducted by either an attorney, such as myself, or um, an HR manager that is licensed to do that. Um, and they have to go through specific training. It's all set forth in the labor code, so if you, if you have any questions on that, feel free to let me know. There should be, in your harassment policy, examples of behavior that isn't permissible. Uh, so take a, take a moment to review what, what exactly you have in your handbooks and in your policies so that you're fully aware. Uh, and, you know, even just use these PowerPoint slides and, and um, compare them to what you have. Keep in mind that third parties can expose you to a harassment claim as well. So, for example, if you have you know, the Coke machine in the break room and the, the guy who's coming in to refill the Coke machine is harassing your employees. That can expose you to a claim. Um, so it's not just about employees with other employees. Don't fire your employees when they get sick. This is, this is um, top, top way number four uh, to get yourself exposed to a claim. Uh, there are some major California federal, California and federal laws that provide protections. The, the two big ones are ADA and the FMLA. Those are, those are federal laws, but California has similar laws. Um, California Family Rights Act provides for leave. There's paid sick leave um, and leave as required under the California Workers' Compensation Act. Um, pregnancy disability leave. Um, leave is a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, uh, as is listed up there. Compare that to um, wage replacement, that's something different. So um, short-term disability or paid family leave um, or vacation or PTO or sick time, th those are different things. Um, so the ADA, um, one of the more frequent claims I see, uh, the ADA requires you to provide a reasonable accommodation for someone with a disability, that accommodation can include a leave of absence. Um, likewise, at FMLA and uh, California Family um, Rights Act, those provide for leave for a serious health condition of your employee or of a family member of your, of your employee. Um, so whenever someone brings to your attention that you know there's a p potential illness, either their own or a family member, and they're needing to take some time off, um, look at, you have to look at their eligibility right away. Um, so there's a minimum service requirement for these things to apply of 12 months. They need to have been employed with you for 12 months. And they need to have worked 1,250 hours in the last 12 months. And then, um, there's a, a minimum work site requirement as well. You need to have 
employed 50 employees within a radius of 75 miles. Um, so you need to take these factors into account every time a request is made. Timing is key. So like I said, firing your employees once they get sick, it's not a good idea. So here we have a, a six-figure jury reward for, in this case, the guy was, and this is pretty typical of the claims I see, where the employer was already planning on letting this person go. You know, there were documented performance issues, and then they make their, they make their uh, request for leave, or they go out on leave, and then they get fired. That's, that's going to pose a problem. Um, so keep that in mind. Is there, is there any kind of requirement for paid leave versus non-paid leave? So the, for CIFRA and FMLA, those are, they're non-paid. Um, to the extent that you, as the employer, provide you know, paid time off or vacation time, um, that's, that's up to you. But the federally uh, and state protected uh, leave, those, those are unpaid. So number five, you know, making making um, promises to your employees that you can't keep um, promising them a job forever, or creating uh, essentially creating an employment contract with them, uh, is another good way to run into a claim. So I'm sure most of you have heard we're an at-will state, um, and that that's the case in most states. Employees are presumed to be at-will, meaning they can leave at any time or you can terminate them at any time, uh, as opposed to a contract that's for a set duration. Um, is California one of those states? California is an at-will state. Uh, so a common, one, one common question that I get from my clients is, oh, you know, do I, do I need to then give a reason when I terminate employees? Um, because we're an at-will state, right? It's actually very important that you give an accurate reason for terminating the employee in order to avoid discrimination claims. And to the extent that it's based on their uh, performance, um, you know, or, or any sort of um, act on their part where they, you know, didn't live up to your expectations, you need to have that documented. Um, likewise, at will doesn't mean that you can terminate them for any reason at all, uh, because there are certain protections. Um, for example, you know, race, national origin. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not documenting your rationale, then an employee might point to, you know, their race and say that that was the real reason. And if you don't have that reason documented, then you don't really have any way to back yourself up. With respect to your handbook, um, I mentioned that you should include a provision that has that says that your employees are at will. Um, one good uh, example of that, saying that you, you know your at will status can only be changed by in writing by a certain person. Um, don't have a provision that allows any pro any uh, provisions in the handbook to be changed at any time. Then that you, you can. They can point to that later on and say, oh, well, in practice, you know, they started doing this. Um, so the handbook, you know, it, it, the policy changed. So progressive uh, discipline is important um, when you have someone who you're going to terminate um, based on their job performance. Um, so, so document it. Um, don't, don't leave you know, anything out of your handbook. Um, and then keep an acknowledgement form, as I mentioned before. And I've, I've got some good acronyms for you, to the, if, you're, if you're an acronym person, to help you kind of remember what you need to do, depending on whether you've got a, a performance termination, for example. So you have to give the employee, um, or you should be giving the employee you know, notice of the problem, explain to them how to improve, um, give them assistance and set a, a set time for them to improve. That's often referred to as a PIP or a performance improvement plan.
With respect to the notice, it should be in writing. Um, so verbal counseling is not a good idea. Um, a common thing that I've heard from clients, oh, you know, um, we didn't do a write-up because the manager verbally counseled them. Well, verbal counseling is going to be of really limited use in defending a discrimination claim, for example, uh, because there's no, there isn't going to be any proof that that counseling occurred, especially if you don't have a witness there, but juries like to see something, um, and I like to be able to point to something if I'm defending a claim that's on paper, um, and that you know we can we can physically look to, um, especially if the employment employee had to sign off on it. With respect to the write up or the termination, it's important to include every reason why uh, you're giving that documentation. Um, so some people might say, oh, you know, I don't want to look heavy handed or I don't want to look, you know, harsh. It's critical that you give every actual reason for discipline or termination because any undocumented reason might come back to haunt you. Um, at the same time, though, you shouldn't be making anything up that isn't supported by facts. Um, so there's a delicate balance there. Another common problem I see is vague language. So, for example, writing that someone is insubordinate or um, you know, they've got a, I, I see the bad attitude a lot. Well, how did they have a bad attitude? Give me facts, give me dates, give me times. Um, you know, any witnesses, and what, what specifically did they do to, you know, have a bad attitude? There's a, there's a huge difference between saying, you know, they've got a bad attitude versus, you know, on this day, at this time, this employee uh, yelled at a customer, for example. That's going to go a lot farther than, than just saying, you know, they've got a bad attitude. Likewise, you should avoid specific threats. You don't want to box yourself in. Um, so give yourself some room. Um, and then finally, you should have the employee actually sign and acknowledge that you gave them that write-up. Um, consider, you know, persuasive techniques or just have them write on the document at any point. Um, it doesn't have to be a signature. Just like maybe provide them with a, a uh, space to put an explanation. And that way you can actually point to the fact that they were there, they received the write-up. Juries often question whether or not the employee actually got notice. Um, and then keep in mind that you should you should always have two people there, um, even if it is in writing. As I mentioned, a lot of a lot of times I run into situations where it's just verbal counseling. Um, if the employee refuses to sign, then you have that that witness there to back you up to say yes, this employee refused to sign. I was there. The message was delivered. Um, when you're terminating someone, you should always evaluate the possibility that they could bring a discrimination claim. Um, so compare how you've treated other employees who have committed similar you know, violations in the past or that you've had similar issues with. Did you terminate them? Did you write them up? Um, what, what did you do in that situation? And that gives you some, some backup to say, okay, well, I've, I've treated everyone the same, um, so you can point to that if, if uh, someone brings a discrimination claim against you. That being said, I think I'm, I'm out of time. Looks like we've gone an hour. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to email me or give me a call. I've got my direct line on there, um, so you don't have to deal with an annoying receptionist. Mentioned I can take a few now, so if you guys have any questions, in the back there. Did you mention earlier that we're not allowed to ask about our uh, criminal convictions in the past of a uh, prospective employee? Right. Better? So, so ban the box legislation. Ban, um, we'll say ban the box. Ban the box. Ban the box. Okay. Yeah. So at first I was 
when I first heard of this legislation, I was a little unsure of what it was. I was thinking, oh, cardboard boxes, or you know, what is this going to affect my Amazon Prime shipments? We can't, we can't have this. But no, it's it's the box um, on the employment application that that's the checkbox. So, so if we don't run a background check on someone and they were terminated from their last job for punching someone out and maybe did some time for that, we weren't allowed to ask that. Now we hire them and after work out in the parking lot of the employee parking, they punch out an employee and their lawyer finds out, gee, uh, the employer may have negligently hired here because this person has a history of doing that and you put the right, yeah, that's guy in close proximity to this person and how can we avoid negligent hiring if we're not able to run a background check on someone who potentially could be a serious problem. Right. How are so, we supposed to do that? Right? So let me let me start out by saying that generally speaking, the California legislature does not care about protecting employers. I understand. Um, so so with that background in mind, uh, so you can run a background check on someone um, based on the language in this in this pending legislation, but it can only be done after a conditional offer is extended to them. And then from there, so you, you go through the interview process, you're not allowed to ask anything about their criminal history, um, and then you extend the conditional offer conditioned on the background check. You run the background check, you get the background check back, and if you see something on there that, set, that makes you want to then revoke the offer, there are a bunch of hoops that you have to go through. It's called the, the fair chance process. Um, so. So would we be able to say, well, there were several candidates that we extended this offer to, and you were in the running, and we appreciate it. Thanks, and have a nice day. No. No. Uh, if you're making the determination based on, it sounds like it would be based on their background check results, you have to be able to point to um, a job duty or part of the job in some way related to their conviction. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, one, one example that I give is a janitor who is uh, supervising other individuals at night on a graveyard shift who was convicted of sexual assault three years ago. Um, well, you would be able to point to the fact that this was okay. a recent conviction, that they're going to be supervising people, and there aren't going to, there isn't going to be a lot of supervision for them. Okay, how about the one I use where they punch someone out? It, it's going to depend on um, how long ago it was, you know, how, how egregious or how violent it was. At um, the time, they were convicted. So you, you, would, you would be able to make that argument, um, but to the extent that you run into those issues, you're going to have to go through the process and, and be able to, you know, point to reasons why you are not going to extend their offer. Or why? If you don't go through that process, the legislation gives them a right to a private action against you. Yeah, um, and so it doesn't it doesn't take into account, unfortunately, the you know the concerns of employers of negligent hiring claims and, and so forth. Um, so I would say, to the extent that you get someone coming through the door with uh, you know, and you run a background check and it concerns you, um, and you're going to have to go through that process to get get counsel involved, um, and that way you'd have the best the best argument to make. Number one and number two, you make sure you're going through the process properly. Okay. Thank you. Yes. When, when is this supposed to go into effect? So the governor has until I believe it's the 15th. So until Sunday to sign it. Um, he hasn't. As of this morning, I checked and he hasn't signed it yet. Um, so. There, it would go into effect, I believe, the beginning of the year. So next year, it wouldn't it wouldn't be immediate. Um, but I would, you know, it's it's not very far away. So yes. you'd have to conduct a um, a review of your job applications, any sort of advertisements that you're putting out there, and then the actual interview process yourself, itself. Um, so not only can you not ask on the job application, but you have to make sure that anyone involved in the interview process knows that they can't ask any sort of question to solicit that information. I have a quick question. One more, yes. Um, actually, my question is going to be two questions. 
Sure. First of all, um, about the drugs and um, alcohol. Uh, even though if you have the employee for five years, you don't have to stay to get an I know you can do the drug test on him, but how many a year, uh, how many times a year you can do drug tests? Not on just one particular because you have more than two employees. But can we uh, have like every year we have to do drug tests or no? No, you cannot do um, just a blanket drug test on all your employees once once they're actually on board with you. You're only permitted to test if you have reasonable suspicion. But even though you have the employee for like three, seven years or ten years or whatever. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No. So if you have reasonable suspicion that someone is coming to work impaired, then it's it's okay to drug test. Regardless of how long they've worked for you. And the second question is about the right up. Sure. Um, if you're an employee, you just hired an employee and it's been there, she's been there for almost eight years. And every time you're teaching her something, she goes, oh, okay. And then the next month, she would forget when you have to teach her again. Uh, because every month you have to do it, you have to inventory. Uh, how, and also she's always like, can you write her up and hire her at that minute? Or if you have to? So the law doesn't require you to counsel, but it's important to do that because you'll have that as backup if they bring a claim later on saying, oh, you know, you fired me because I'm African American, or you fired me because I'm a woman, as opposed to the real reason you fired them was because they weren't performing properly. Um, so you would document and, and actually have a, a sit down, uh, ideally with, with a witness there, um, an appropriate person like a supervisor or manager, and you would go through an actual write-up with them of specifically what they did wrong. So, you know, inventory issues, um, explain what was wrong with what they did, and explain that they were late all the time. And any other uh, grievance that you have, put it all in writing, go through it with the employee, explain what they need to do. Um, and then if you get to a certain point, you know, it could be after, you know, one write-up and they don't, Perform, uh, then you do a termination notice. But walk through those steps and create as much documentation as you can. Thank you. All right, thank you all so much. It was great speaking with you.